chapter 5, we'll begin reading in verse number 6. Romans chapter 5, verse number 6. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet peradventure for a good man, some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more, being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. <laughs> can sing when I pause to remember a heartache here is but a stepping stone along a trail that's winding always upward this troubled world is not my final their vow. 
value if we recall they're borrowed for a while and things of earth that cause this heart to tremble remembered there will only bring a smile but until then Bibles open there at Romans chapter number 5 this morning. In the 1600s, the English poet wrote one of the most famous poems that have been known throughout time. It is called Paradise Lost. In that poem, he recounts the fall of Satan from heaven, but more important to us is that we see the fall of man. And as you go back to the book of Genesis, and you find in the book of Genesis, Adam and Eve, they chose to ignore the command of God concerning the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And having broken God's commands, they were left to deal with the consequences of sin, a loss of privilege in the Garden of Eden, difficulty in work and uh, difficulty in birth, separated from God and ultimately death. But God was not willing to leave man in that terrible state. God in His infinite wisdom had redemption's plan already laid out when He came to man on that fateful day. In the midst of judgment, God gave hope in the plan to redeem mankind. And in Romans chapter 5 this morning we find the essence of this plan laid out for us and the importance of one man. The Bible tells us that as uh, in verse 12 that it was by one man sin entered into the world. And so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned, is because of one man's choice. One man's uh, decision to take of that which God said not to take of, but also on the same token, on the other side, if you will, there is one man. And that other man is the man who brought redemption through a perfect sacrifice. In the first five verses of chapter 5, we find here, thus here, that therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And it's that justification that He provides for us. God lays a foundation for us here to remind us that it's nothing that we have done, but it's all through the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, His love for us and His sacrifice for us, providing for us to be seen by God as being justified. Justified is an interesting word. It is not just uh, simply uh, something that we just kind of pass over, gloss over. But you understand that whenever the Bible says that we are justified, it means that we stand before God as being just, as being holy, as being without sin. 
And it's not because of anything that we have done. It's because of the righteousness of Jesus Christ that uh, we are clothed in. It's all because of God's grace that we have this hope. In verse 5 the Bible says, And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. We needed that grace of God. Uh, we needed God to come down and to make a change uh, for us. And we needed help. And so Paul here in these verses we have looked at this morning begins to lay out for us the why. Why did we need grace? Why did we need a Savior? And it's an important thing to understand. It just uh, uh, Some people have this idea that, well, we're all okay, we're all going to get to heaven one day, and that's not the truth. That all roads do not lead to heaven. Uh, we were talking yesterday morning, we were uh, having a, uh, our bus and visitation meeting everything here this morning, uh, uh, yesterday morning, and uh, I was standing in there, and, uh, and I think Landrum has uh, got in there too already, and we were both standing in there, and Brother Flugie comes walking in, he goes, how'd you guys get in here? You know, is there another way in? Is there, is there a secret passage or something? He was joking. <laughs> I said, no, sir, it's just like heaven. There's only one door. And, uh, you know, I said, and that's what we're going out to do. And, uh, you know, but that's the truth. There's only one way to heaven. There's only one, dire there's only one door. The Bible says, uh, J Jesus says this here, I am the door. Uh, he says, I, by me, if any man enter in, uh, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and have pasture. Uh, you see, there's only one way in for salvation. But you've got to understand, before anybody ever walks through that door of salvation, they have to understand there is a need. There is a need. We, we do not come to Christ just because, well, it's just something to add on. When, the, uh, when, when J Japan, I believe it was, opened up to the West, uh, there was flooded with missionaries. And as the missionaries came in, they were sending reports back here to the States of, of having dozens and dozens of, uh, of converts. And they were amazed at how many folks were putting their faith in Christ. But as there was a deeper uh, 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 looking into things, they were finding they were not accepting Christ exclusively. Instead, they were adding Christ to the many gods they already yeah. believed in. Yeah. And you understand, Christ is not just an addition to our life. It is an exclusion. He excludes everybody else. He excludes everything else in our life. And so we've got to come to a point where we understand that uh, without Him, we're in trouble. And that's what, that's what Romans 5 uh, here is dealing with. Notice there in verse number 6, uh, we see man's troubling condition. It says this here, For when we were without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. We first see here man's troubling condition is this here, is that first off he is without strength. He's without strength. What is, what is, that? What is the uh, writer here talking about? What is the Holy Spirit trying to uh, get us to understand? He wants us to understand that we have no ability to help ourselves. Yeah. We have no ability to reach up to God on our own. Uh, there was a teaching many, many years ago that talked about this, and it still is prevalent in a lot of places, that there is a divine spark uh, of, of divinity, if you will, a spark of divinity in mankind. Can I tell you, there is no spark of divinity within mankind. Uh, there is no possibility that we will ever, ever reach uh, uh, to the levels of God Himself. We need a say. We're without strength. Uh, just like somebody who is too weak to pull themselves up uh, out of the bed, and so they need somebody to come along and to help them up, or they, uh, they have those mechanical beds where they will lift up to, so they're able to, uh, to get. They don't have the strength to get. We don't have the strength to reach up to God. We're, we're without strength. We don't like that. We don't like to be in a place where we have no strength. Uh, we don't like to be in a place where we are compromised. And so we will do our best to avoid it. But God wants us to come to the understanding that we are without strength. We had no way of attaining God. But also this, notice he says this, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. We see that we were without God. Without God. We, we like to put in a bunch of other gods in our lives to try to help placate that missing piece. People will worship a lot of things in their life to, in order to try to, uh, to get peace inside, but they find no peace. Why? Because there's only one thing that satisfies that longing in the heart, and that is God Himself. God puts that inside of us. He, he made us in such a way so we would understand that when we are without God, we need something. 
No matter how much our society wants to build the self-esteem of mankind, the fact remains that we are ungodly. We're ungodly on our own standing. If you came to God like a Pharisee saying, look God what you're getting, what a wonderful gift, you're, you didn't get Him. You've got to come to God understanding, God, I am wretched, I am poor, I am without strength. God, I am not worth your time. That, that's the attitude we should have. That's the attitude. We've got to look. We've, we have built ourselves up here, and we need to get back to where the Bible talks about the fact that, I believe it was Isaiah uh, talking about himself being as a worm. We don't like thinking about that, do we? We don't like saying, well, 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 I'm not such a bad guy. You're ungodly. Right. You're wicked. Yes. You're a sinner. And until we come to that point, until we receive and accept that fact, you cannot receive salvation. Right. It's impossible to receive salvation when there is pride in our hearts thinking that we have something to offer to God. It is impossible. And what, what, the, what the writer here is giving to us, what the Holy Spirit is trying to help us understand is that we have no strength. We don't have God. We are in trouble. In fact, Romans chapter 1 illustrates the fact that mankind is at war with God. It's not God who has declared war, but man who has declared war against God. Uh, he has rejected God. Uh, he has gone his own way. Uh, he has lifted the creation above the Creator. Man has done all those things. God has been gracious. God has been long-suffering to us, and He reaches out to us, and He wants us to come, but we've got to come His way. We've got to come by His way. And so we have to understand that we are without strength, that we are without God, but also this, we are without help. We're without help. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. We need help. We need somebody to reach out to us and to, to give us uh, that, that help. Uh, uh, Paul, as he writes here, he asks the question, who is willing to die for a perfect man? Who's willing to die for a perfect man? Who in here would be willing to die for somebody that you thought was perfect? You would lay your life down for them. We, we value life. We, we want to protect life. We'll, we'll, we'll spend the last dime that we have in our bank account and then extend our credit out as far as it will go in order to help preserve our life. God put that in us. Okay, God wants us to find life is precious. And so we understand that whenever he says, uh, who would die for a perfect man? And then he goes on and he asks this question, uh, who is willing to die for even a pretty good guy? He said, uh, one who, would, uh, who is, was, he would scarcely die for somebody like that. Well, they're, they're a fairly good guy, but hey, you know what? That's their deal. That's not my deal. That's man's mentality, and that's our mentality by, just by nature. You know, we, we think about this here that uh, where we're at, we are without help here, that, uh, that nobody is willing to come along to be a help to us, and nobody's there to, uh, to lift us up. And even if somebody were willing to, they couldn't do it for you because they're in the same boat. It's like seeing two drowning men out in the lake, and one comes to the other, and he tries to help the other one. He can't help, any, he can't help him. He's got, his own, he's got his own problems. He's got his own deal he's got to deal with, and uh, he's got to get uh, help for himself as well. It would be hard to find one who is willing to die for a complete stranger, wouldn't it? And also, I want you to notice this here. There's another problem. There's another problem. Look down at verse 12 again. Wherefore is by one man sin. Sin entered into the world. Sin's presence came in by one man. By one man. You understand pride. We, we, we have a hard time with this because we don't know what it was like. But in the Garden of Eden, whenever God created everything, there was nothing wrong. There was no sin. There was no murder. There was no adultery. Uh, there was no deception, deceitfulness, lying to one another. There was, no, uh, uh, there, there was none of that stuff until the, until the serpent came in. And then he convinced man, and when man took that fruit, and he ate of that fruit that God told him not to, sin entered into the world by one man's choice. Wow. I wonder if Adam could look down through the portals of time and see the billions of people who would dwell on this earth, all from him going back to him eventually, if he could see the billions of people that he would 
damned to a devil's hell, would he stop and not take part of that fruit? I don't know. But this is what I do know. He did take the fruit. And he did damn God's creation to an eternal punishment of hell. That's where we're all headed to. That's, what's, that's what has happened. One man, by one man's choice, sin entered into the world. And what was the, what was the result of that? Notice here, sin's penalty given to us. And death by sin. And so death passed upon all men for that all have sinned. Not just a physical death. Uh, we've seen that this week uh, uh, as we've, uh, we've, we've heard about these who have, who have passed on. And there are many, many, many others who have passed on into eternity as well. And as I was thinking on that this week about those who have gone on into eternity, I'm thankful that there is a hope of heaven uh, that is given to us for, uh, uh, for Reagan and, and for, for Brother Houston and, and for Nadia. Lord, I, I'm so thankful there is a hope of heaven. But you understand there are thousands who have gone out into eternity and they have no hope. Because death came by sin. And it's just not a physical death. It is a eternal death that God is talking about. It wasn't just the physical. Yes, the physical uh, was going to have to die because of sin entering. But God told Adam and Eve this year that when they ate of that fruit, that they would die immediately. Well, they didn't fall over dead, did they? Oh, but they did die. They did die. The spirit died immediately whenever they took of the fruit and they chose to ignore God. Listen, my friend, this morning, there is a hope that can be had, but we got to understand it's not through anything that we can do. It's not through something that we can have, uh, something that we can, uh, we can muster up and we're going we're gonna to just power through this thing. No, if we're going to have those things that we need, we're going to have to understand that there is a penalty for death, or a penalty for sin at his death, but there is a cure to come. There is a cure that God gives to us for that death. Something that we don't like to think about, physical death for sure, but spiritual. Spiritual death, a separation. Death is that. It is a separating. Physical death is simply this, is the separation of the soul from the body. There are many who have teach, who still teach to this day, especially in our country, and this here, as they believe this here, is that whenever you draw your last breath, you simply go back to the grave, you go back to the ground, and you return to the dust, and that's the end of it. The Bible doesn't say that. The Bible tells us differently. The Bible tells us here, yes, uh, the body goes back to the, uh, to the ground, uh, and we will return to dust, if you will, but there is a soul. See, that's what God, God did something different with man than he did with every part, other part of creation. Every other part of creation, it was spoken in existence and life was spoken into uh, this way here. But whenever it came to man, God breathed into the, uh, Adam's nostrils the, uh, the breath of life and man became a living soul. And what that means there is this here is that he is going to dwell somewhere for eternity. For all eternity, he's going to dwell somewhere and there's only two choices. There's no in between. There's no third choice. There's heaven and there is hell. There is the eternal bliss of, of being in God's presence or there is the eternal destruction of being separated from God. And that's what eternal death is. Eternal death is an eternal separation from God. That is what happened in the garden. And that is what Paul is dealing with here as he talks about this here. Look at verse 13. It says, For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed where there is no law. He said, We didn't have the law until Moses came along, right? So nobody must have died until that time. Oh, no, that's not what happened, is it? Verse 14, Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. Oh, they didn't eat a, a piece of fruit like Adam did. No, they committed other sins. They, they committed other things that were an offense to God. And he said, yes, uh, we, we see those things there. Uh, he said, but I want you to understand that God, the sin's power extends all over, all over all of mankind. He said, well, well, not everybody had the law. You're right, but there's 
you're still under the law. You're still under the law. And we see sin's power as a problem. It's man's troubling condition. He's without strength. He's without God. He's without help. And he is under, he's under the, uh, the presence of sin in his life. And so it needed something special. And that's where verse 8 comes in. Verse 8, but God. But God. You see, if there was not a but God, we would all be in trouble. Without God stepping in and saying, we're going to change the narrative of this here, we would all be hopeless. But God commendeth His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We see here, God, <coughs> excuse me, we see here, <coughs> I'll get that out of me there, God's amazing love. We sang about it a lot this morning. I appreciate the songs Brother Miller pre, uh, uh, pulled out. I don't think he had any idea what was being uh, preached on this morning. Isn't the love of Jesus something wonderful? Yes. Oh, how he loves you and me. Amen. But God commendeth his love toward us. The, the gift of Christ is, is always the proof of God's love. John three sixteen, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. Ephesians chapter number 5, and uh, look over at verse uh, chapter 5 and verse number 25. The Bible uh, tells us this here. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave Himself for it. The gift of Christ is a proof of God's love. God loves us. His love is unconditional. It's unconditional. He died for who? The ungodly. Remember the question? Uh, it says, for, uh, for, for when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. He, he came to those who could not do anything for themselves, those who were outside of God, those who were away from Him, those who had offended his Father. He came and He died for them. What love that would extend out and would come to those who had sh shaken their fist at Him. Think of Him as He's on the cross. As they come by and they wag their heads at Him and they revile Him. They say, He saved others. Himself He cannot save. So He cried out there on the cross, Eli, Eli, Lama Sabachthani. Uh, they, they ran to get Him some. They said, No, be, be still. Let's see if Elijah will come. They thought he was calling out for Elijah. See, there, there was all they were they were putting him up there, and even though one of the thieves on, on one of the on one of the crosses there began to uh, cast these same things in his own mouth and began to uh, uh, accuse Christ as he hung there next to him. And yet he still loved us. And yet he still said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. What amazing love. What amazing love. Man's condition was helpless. He was powerless. He was in a terrible place. But God loved us unconditionally. He did not wait for us to turn over a leaf. He did not wait for us to get cleaned up. He does not uh, tell us, well, you know, come back later whenever you got a little more to offer than what you are today. No, he says, come unto me. Come unto me. He, the invitation is for everybody, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, shall be saved. His love is unconditional, but His love is incomparable as well. It's it, is, it compares to nobody else. You think about it, you, you extend love to somebody, but they reject your love, it's hard to keep loving them. And you can keep putting it out there, and you can keep putting it out there, and if they keep rebuffing, they keep rebuffing, they keep rebuffing, eventually we get tired. Eventually we give up. Eventually we say it's no use. But not God. God's love was this here while we were yet sinners. While we were still uh, committed to being sinners. While we were so engrossed with our sin, Christ died for us. 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 15, the Bible tells this here, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. What love. What love, 
What, what an amazing love that God would st- extend His self out to us. Oh, man was in a terrible condition. But God's love came through and caused us to have a, a wonderful opportunity. So what are the benefits? What are the benefits that God extends to us? Here's what we can, uh, we can know. Look at verse number 9 with me. Much more than. Much more than. You say, what does that mean? He said, I'm going to tell you what else you got. Yes, you got Christ died for us. You've got salvation is offered through you there. But there's a whole lot more than just a ticket to heaven. That's what he said. There's a lot more to this here. He says this here much more than. First thing he tells this is that we are justified by his blood. We're justified. We can stand before God this morning knowing that we have access to the Father. And if we come into the Father... uh, the name of Jesus Christ, and, and we are saved, and we put our faith and trust in, in Christ, and, and we receive Him as our Savior. We don't come robed in our own righteousness. We come robed in the righteousness of Christ. And when He sees me, He doesn't see Brian Wilson. He sees Jesus Christ. And because of that, I stand before Him as if I'd never sinned. Oh, I know the sin I've committed. I know the sin I'm guilty of. I know I'm a wretch. I know I'm poor and I'm I'm not worthy of that love. But it's because I'm dressed in Christ's righteousness. I have access. And so when he looks at me, he simply says, Son, what do you need? It's enough that I'm going to uh, escape the fires of hell. It's enough that I'm not going to have to spend a single moment in hell uh, for my sin. I'm not going to go to purgatory and burn off a bunch of them before I get there. Christ's blood took care of all of it. And so I'm justified before him. And so I stand before him and I don't get it. I don't understand it because I don't deserve it. But he says, this is the way it is. I'm justified. I'm justified. What an amazing thing to think that God would look on me in such a way. I'm justified. But not only that, am I justified. Notice he says this, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Oh, there's a whole bunch to unpack right there. But suffice it to say that before I came to Christ, I was under the wrath of God. I was destined to, be, uh, to endure his wrath for all eternity. But when he saved me, he saved me from that wrath to come. He kept me from having to experience it. It's not, well, you're going to have to go experience a little bit of it. No. All of it. I get to avoid all of his wrath. He, that, that, that love that he has extended to me and I have received has caused me to miss out on that horrible thing called wrath. You do a study of that word in the, in the Bible and you'll find the wrath of God is something that is severe. It's consuming. And it's something that you don't want to deal with. He gives us a way out. What is that way out? It's through the blood of His precious Son, Jesus Christ. The judgment of our sins. The Bible says that the judgment of our sins were poured out upon Him on that cross. That day as he hung on that cross and from the time of noon time whenever all it should have been the brightest part of the day and suddenly it became dark all over. Darkness covered the earth as God turned his back on his only begotten son. As the wrath or as the sin of mankind was poured out upon him and he was taking my judgment, he was taking my penalty For those three hours as he endured, we cannot, we cannot fathom this. We can't understand this. For all eternity past, the Father and the Son were in perfect communion, in perfect relationship, never, ever, ever being separated one from the other. And here as he hung on that cross, and as God poured a hold of the wrath, that he had stored up on him. And God had to do this to his own son. I can't look, son. I, I, I'm, I'm too holy to even behold sin. As he cried out on that cross that day, my God, my God. Why hast thou forsaken me? 
Oh, yes, the pain was intense. Yes, the beating he had taken was intense. Yes, there was uh, the, the terrible things done to him. Oh, I'm sure the pain, uh, uh, the body throbbed in pain. And, and I'm sure there were spasms like we could not imagine going through him physically. But oh, the spiritual anguish. The anguish of soul at that time that got poured out on him had caused his own father for the only time that will ever happen in all of history if God turned his back on his only begotten son. Why? For you? So that you would not have to experience the wrath of God. What love. Man. What love. Christ giving his life for us saves us from the penalty of sin. Christ giving his life to us saves us from the power of sin. And one day, one day, it will be what saves us from the presence of sin. It's coming one day. But oh, I love this here as well. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God. By the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Reconciliation. Reconciled, may, being made right. You know, have you ever had somewhere where somebody you were at odds with? Somebody had done something to you or you had done something to somebody else and there was just that friction that was in, in life. And there was just, I mean, there's constantly just, I mean... Oh, every time it's just like you, you knew whenever you just like uh, your blood pressure went up whenever they stepped into the room, that kind of a deal. That's where we were at with God. Any time that God would think upon man because of his sinfulness, oh, it, it, the Bible says this here in, the, in Genesis 6 that it repented God that he had made man. That's how much he hates sin. Oh, I wish I'd have never made mankind. Boy, what a statement. What a statement, but that's what sin is. And so when Christ came and he died, he made reconciliation. He made things right so that there was a, a, a cooling. <laughs> there was a peace that was brought. Ephesians, I believe chapter 2 says it this way, that there was a wall of partition that was built between man and God. And Christ came and he tore that wall down and he joined the, and he was able to bring the two parties together. By the way, that's why he tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 that we are to have the ministry of reconciliation ourselves. <coughs> why? Because we know what it's like to be reconciled. We've been reconciled. Oh, the wrath that should have come, but no, it's been reconciled. Oh, the, uh, the, we were at enmity with God, but no, we have been reconciled. Why? Because of what Christ did for us. Because of that, we are able to live our lives through Christ. It also, notice here, it produces uh, praise in our life also. Verse 11, not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That one that we used to have, that we used to hate, that one that we were at odds with, that one that we, we were like, I'm going to fight against God and I'll shake my fist at God. All those things, that was our heart. That's the way mankind was. Now all of a sudden, we rejoice in God. Why do we rejoice in God? It's not because of anything I've done, but it's because of Jesus Christ. That now I can have joy. I can sing about this here. Isn't the love of Jesus something wonderful? And I can actually sing it with a smile on my face because I've experienced that. And all of a sudden, I look at God and say, God, you're so awesome. You're so wonderful. Lord, I want to praise you. I want to thank you. That comes out because of the joy that God gives to us because of being reconciled through Christ Jesus. Before you were saved, you did not have any praise for God. You didn't have it. Oh, you may have sung the songs. <laughs> you may have went through things, but there was no joy. There was no, uh, there, was, there, was this, there was this fear more of God and there was not a lot of praise and a lot of uh, worship of Him. Instead, it was a fearfulness of Him. But now we have received reconciliation. Now I come to Him in confidence and I can give Him praise. It's the joy that we have in God through our Lord Jesus Christ by whom we have now received atonement. Well, what an amazing thing God has done for us. What an amazing thing. God wants us to understand that it's all about what he has done. Look down at verse 15 with me if you would. Verse 15 the Bible says this, but not as the offense so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one many be dead, 
Much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. It is by the grace of God that we can receive this. And just like sin was passed upon all men because of one man's decision, so the grace of God is extended to every single person by one man. Same principle. Same thing. He said, just like it happened over there, the bad stuff, the good stuff comes through one man as well. Now, it's up to us. It's up to us. We want to receive the grace of God. We all received this over here already. You were born, you received it. It was an inheritance. Thank you. I didn't want it. But you got it anyway. But you know, you don't have to live in that inheritance. You can choose to receive this one as well. There, there's two men standing there for us. You have to choose which one you're going to receive. But I want you to understand this here, that, that God is, uh, is extending to us and letting us know this here, that uh, we are uh, freed from that bankruptcy. The, uh, the offense leaves us bankrupt, but God's gift of grace frees us from its penalty. Uh, but also look at this here, verse 16. And not as if it was by uh, one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation, but the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. He says this here, we are, by that grace, same grace, we are freed from the blame. We are freed from the blame. Uh, sin's guilt is removed because of one man. Oh, what an amazing thing. What an amazing thing that God would reach out and do such for us. Look at verse 17. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. We're freed from the bondage that we were once under. Oh, that, that offense puts us under the condemnation of eternal death, separated from God. Uh, but God's gift of grace frees us from the eternal consequences of sin. What an amazing thing that God has done for us. And it's all because of His grace. It's grace. It's seen in the grace that provides for the gift, the, the abundant supply. Notice there in verse 18, Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Even so, the righteous of one, the free gift, came upon all men unto justification of life. There's an abundant supply of God's grace that can take care of everybody. I like what the Bible says, whereby as one man, notice there, uh, for as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one, shall many be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Oh, we see the offense and we, are, uh, we understand our own sinfulness. and We say, God, how could you love a, a sinner such as I? And here's what he says, my grace is sufficient. My grace, you say, oh, but the offense is abound. He says, I know, but my grace did much more abound. We often see sin as, the, as, a, as this huge mountain, and we should, but understand God's grace is larger than that. And that's what He wants us to understand, that His grace far exceeds those things. When God finally gave the law, it was so that the guiltiness of sin might become apparent. But then at once He manifested His grace, His unmerited favor to guilty sinners. Oh, He wanted us to understand what He was offering us. And I want you to see this here, the sovereignty of God's grace. Verse 21, that as sin hath reigned unto death, even so my grace reign through righteousness. That word reign has the idea of being in control. That's the word sovereignty. It is the one that is in control of things. Yes, at one time sin reigned and it control, it brought death. But now here we have the grace that reigns through the righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. Nothing, nothing can stand in the way of God's grace. Nothing is more powerful than God's grace. And this morning, that's what He offers to all of us. He has paid the penalty. Sin came by one man. We were without strength. We were without hope. We were without help. We were without God. We were under that burden of sin. And then God stepped in. And He provided all these wonderful things. He's done all of this here. If all He ever did was just save us and allow us to be in heaven, and He just gave us a little cabin in the corner of glory, that'd be good enough. That's not what He offers. No, no, no. There's much more. Much more. Too many of us 
too many times in our life we are satisfied living like a pauper when we're truly a son of the king. Let's, not, let's understand what God is offering to us and what God gives to us. God has done everything possible for us to dwell with Him for all eternity. But not just eternity. He's also provided a way for us to have the strength to live this life the way that pleases Him. And it is all through the work of Christ on the cross. When we were unable to do anything to help ourselves, He stepped in and did for us what could not be done. The cost. The price of paradise. Well, paradise was lost, yes. When man sinned, paradise lost. But when Christ came and hung on that cross, paradise, the opportunity for paradise was restored. The price of paradise. It was steep. It was costly. But he said this here. I find it worth paying. And so he paid the price. And so this morning I would ask you this here. Will you accept what he's done for you? Will you accept what he's done for you? If you're not saved in here this morning, you do not know Christ as your personal Savior. God did that for you. Amen. And this morning He invites you to come to Him and receive that free gift. Amen. I hope you would let somebody sit down with the Bible and show you what it means to put your faith and trust in Christ. But Christian can I ask you this. I know if I were to ask for a raise of hands, many of hands would go up in here this morning that you're saved. Are you living <clears throat> according to what the Bible says you have? Or are you busy doing things in your own way and trying to do things and try to make a way yourself? Oh, you put your faith and trust in Christ to get you to heaven, but you've got to make a way. The the, you've got to do the rest yourself. No, no, no. No, Christ says, come along. Let me come along. Let me help you. Let me be your strength. Let me be your help. Don't live like a pauper when you're, when you're a child of the king. That makes no sense. You're justified. Come to your father. Talk to Him. Let Him know the needs of your heart. Lay it open to Him. Don't live like a pauper. Father, help us today. God, help us this morning to understand the wonderful thing You have done for us. Lord, You paid the price for paradise. You paid the price for us to receive a home in heaven. You paid the price for us to have strength. You paid the price to give us help. You paid the price to bring reconciliation. You paid the price for it all. And then you offer it to us. You give us the opportunity to come by grace to receive that wonderful gift that you've given to all of us. Oh my Lord, help us not to turn it away this morning. Help us to be in tune with what it is you want us to have, I pray in Jesus' name.